believe it is, of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And when we left off, his teacher had just uh, told him, oh, you know, that being a lawyer wasn't a realistic aspiration for a, um, a black young man or a migger. Remember, I use M instead of N when I'm reading this book. Um, and so he's feeling, he's feeling that and not appreciating that. And so his teacher just told him, you know, basically tried to like douse out his, his aspirations of being a, a lawyer. And let me see, two, four. I usually read y'all about 10 pages and, um, And I'm just trying to figure out where I want to mark to stop, to stop. Um, I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, six, eight, ten. So clearly I didn't fold the page like I would have. Um, and here we go. All right. Oh, no, that's why. <laughs> I marked the wrong page. Sorry, I started the recording before I had myself together. Get, get it, get it together. So he has just talked to his teacher and he doesn't appreciate, um, and he, he recognizes it. He's only in eighth grade, right? So he's about 13, maybe 14. <clears throat> the more I thought afterward about what he said, the more uneasy it made me. It just kept treading around in my mind. What made it really begin to disturb me was Mr. Otrowski's advice to others in my class, all of them white. Most of them had told him they were planning to become farmers, but those who wanted to strike out on their own to try something new, he had encouraged. Some, mostly girls, wanted to be teachers. A few wanted to be other professions, which, as one boy who wanted to become a county agent, another veterinarian, one girl wanted to be a nurse, they all reported that Mr. Otrowski's, Mr. Otrowski had encouraged what they wanted, yet nearly none of them had, had earned marks equal to mine. So marks mean, mean grades. The vocabulary has changed. It was a surprising thing that I had never thought of that way before, but I realized that whatever I wasn't, I was smarter than nearly all of those white kids. But apparently I was still not intelligent enough in their eyes to become whatever I wanted to be. It was then that I began to change on the inside. I drew away from white people. I came to class and I answered when called upon. It became a physical strain simply to sit in Mr. Trotsky's class where Migger had slipped off my back before Wherever I heard it now, I stopped and I looked at whoever said it. And they looked surprised that I did. I quit hearing so much migger and what's wrong? Which was the way that I wanted it. Nobody, including the teachers, could decide what had come over me. I knew I was being discussed. In a few more weeks, it was that way too, at the restaurant where I worked washing dishes and at the Swirlins, the Swirlins where he lives with, um, some people at a boys dormitory if you don't know who the swervins are then you should go back a couple of chapters you're not too far in already and just start from the beginning one day soon after mrs swirlin called me into the living room and there was the state man maynard allen i knew from their faces that something was about to happen she told me that none of them could understand why after I'd done so well in school and on my job and living with them, and after everyone in Mason had come to like me, why I had lately begun to make them all feel that I wasn't happy there anymore. No, let's just, let's just check that out. We've done so much for you, and what we want from you is to show that you are a happy mega, right? So once you aren't giving us what we need, so then that's kind of thinking about people who give people things is because they want a certain response from them or because they're just giving it, right? So it also reminds me of um, 
the previous book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, how after Maya was raped, she just wasn't happy and she wasn't speaking. And um, and she there was this line in there that said, no one wants to be around a morose child. So basically, people are like, get them away from me if they ain't happy. So I don't know. It's something that we can all consider. Um, are we requiring joy from people? And what are we doing to support that joy, right? Are we watching our words and our actions and uh, supporting them? She said she felt there was no need for me to stay at the detention home any longer and that arrangements had been made for me to go and live with the Lyons family who liked me so much. She stood up and put out her hand. I guess I've asked you a hundred times, Malcolm. Do you want to tell me what's wrong? I shook her hand. I said, nothing, Miss Swirling. Then I went and got my things and came back down. At the living room door, I saw her wiping her eyes. I felt very bad. I thanked her and went out in the front to Mr. Allen, who took me over to the Lyons. Says, Mr. and Mrs. Lyons and their children during the two months I lived with them while finishing eighth grade also tried to get me to tell them what was wrong, but somehow I couldn't tell them either. I went every Saturday to see my brothers and sisters in Lansing, and almost every other day I wrote to Ella in Boston. Not saying why, I told Ella that I wanted to come there and live. I don't know how she did it, but she arranged for official custody of me to be transferred from Michigan to Massachusetts, and that very week I finished eighth grade, I again boarded the Greyhound bus for Boston. So remember, Ella is his big sister who looks so much like his dad, and, and she has so much powerful presence that he's just in awe of her, his big sister. And she's big, and she's very dark black, and he is just enamored with her. I've thought about that time a lot since then. No physical move in my life has been more pivotal pivotal, or profound in its re repercussions. I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again because that was too choppy. I've thought about that time a lot since then. No physical move in my life has been more pivotal or profound in its repercussions. <laughs> it wasn't that much more clear, was it? <laughs> If I stayed on in Michigan, I would probably have married one of those Negro girls I knew and liked in Lansing. I might have become one of those state capitol building shoeshine boys or a Lansing County Club waiter or gotten one of the other menial jobs around in those days among Lansing Negroes. Would have been considered successful or even become a carpenter, like Mr. Otrosky said. Whatever I have done since then, I have driven myself to become a success at it. I've often thought of if Mr. Trotsky had encouraged me to become a lawyer, I would today probably be among some city's professional black bourgeois, sipping cocktails and palming myself off as a community spokesman and leader for the suffering black masses, while my primary concern would be to grab a few crumbs from the groaning board of the two-faced whites with whom they're begging to integrate. All praise is due to Allah that I went to Boston when I did. If I hadn't, I'd probably still be brainwashed, black and Christian. Um, wow, isn't it, isn't it a, a wonderful thing? But I mean, I don't know, maybe some people don't think it's wonderful, but isn't it a remarkable thing that he left when he did and became who he, he did, right? For the people who followed him and who were encouraged by him rather than becoming a janitor, you know? Chapter 3, Homeboy. I looked like little Abner. Mason, Michigan was written all over me. My kinky reddish hair was cut like a hick style, and I didn't even use grease in it. My green suit's coat sleeves stopped before my wrist, and my pant legs showed three inches of socks, just a shade lighter green than the suit was on my narrow collar, three-quarter length Lansing department store top coat. My appearance was too much for even Ella. But she told me later that she had seen countryfied members of the little family come up from Georgia in even worse shape than I arrived in. Ella had fixed up a nice little upstairs room for me. And she was truly a Georgia Negro woman when it came to her in the kitchen with her pots and pans. She was the kind of cook who would heap up on your plate as much ham cock, greens, black eyed peas, fried fish, cabbage, sweet potatoes, grits and gravy, and cornbread as she pleased. And the more you put away, the better she felt. I worked out at Ella's kitchen table like there was no tomorrow. Ella seemed 
To be as big, black, outspoken, and impressive a woman as she had been in Mason as she was in Lansing. Only about two weeks before I arrived, she had split up with her second husband, the soldier, Frank, whom I had met there for the previous summer. But she was taking it in stride. I could see, though, and I didn't say, how any average man would find it almost impossible to live for very long with a woman whose very instinct was to run everything and everybody she had anything to do with, including me. About my second day there in Roxbury, Ella told me that she didn't want me to far start hunting for any job right away, like most newcomer Negroes did. She said that she had told all those that she brought from the North to make their time, take their time and walk around, travel the buses in the subway, and get a feel of Boston before they tried to tie themselves down to working somewhere because they would never again have the time to really see and get to know anything about the city they were living in once they started working. Ella said she'd help me find a job when it was time for me to go to work. So I went gawking around the neighborhood, Wombeck and Humboldt Avenue Hill, section of Roxbury, which was something like Harlem Sugar Hill, where I'd later live. I saw those Roxbury Negroes acting and living differently from any black people I'd ever dreamed of in life. This was the snooty black neighborhood. They called themselves 400 and looked their noses down at Negroes of the black ghetto or so-called town section where Mary and my other half-sister lived. I thought I was seeing, I'm sorry, where Mary, my other half, oh yeah, Seth. I thought I was seeing there in Roxbury I thought I was seeing there in Roxbury were high class. I thought, I think, I'm going to, let me see. I'm sorry. What I thought I was seeing there in Roxbury were high class, educated, important Negroes living very well, working in big jobs and positions. Their quiet homes sat back in their mowed yards. These Negroes rocked along the sidewalk looking haughty and dignified on their way to work, to shop, to visit, to go to church. I know now, of course, that what I was really seeing was only a big city version of those successful Negro boot backs and janitors back in Lansing. The only difference was that the ones in Boston had been brainwashed even more thoroughly. They prided themselves on being incomparably more cultured and cultivated and dignified and better off than their black brethren down in the ghetto, which was no further away than you could throw a rock. Under the pitiful misapprehension that it would make them better than others, these hill Negroes were breaking their backs trying to imitate white people. Any black family that had been around Boston long enough to own their home that they lived in was considered among the hill elite. It didn't make any difference that they had no rent out rooms to make ends meet. Then the native born New Englanders among them looked down upon the recently migrating Southerners, the hometowners who lived next door like Ella. And a big percentage of the hill dwellers were in Ella's category, Southern. They were strivers and scramblers and West Indians, whom both the New Englanders and the Southerns called black Jews. Ooh, I never heard that. The West Indian Negroes were called black Jews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Usually it was the Southerners and the West Indians who not only managed to own their own places where they live, but also at least one other house which they rented as income property. The snooty New Englanders usually owned less than they did. In those days on the hill, any who could claim professional status, teachers, preachers, practical nurses, also considered themselves superior. Foreign diplomats could have modeled their conduct on the way the Negro postmen Pullman porters and dining car waiters of Roxbury acted, striding around as if they were wearing top hats and cutaways. I'd guess that eight out of ten of the Hill Negroes of Roxbury, despite the impressive sounding job titles they affected, actually worked as menials and servants like the folks back in Lansing. He's in banking or he's in securities. It sounded as though they were discussing a Rockefeller or a melon and not some gray headed. Um, dignity posturing black janitor or bond house messenger. I'm with an old family was the euphemism used to dignify the professions of white folks 
cooks and maids who talked so effectively among their own kind in Roxbury that you couldn't even understand them. I don't know how many 40 and 50 year old Aaron boys went down the hill dressed like ambassadors in black suits and white collars to the downtown jobs in government, in finance, or in law. It has never ceased to amaze me how many Negroes then and now could stand in the indig indignity of that self, just, um, I'm sorry. It has never ceased to amaze me how so many Negroes then and now could stand in the indignity of that kind of self-delusion. Soon, I ranged out of Roxbury and began to explore Boston proper. Historic buildings everywhere I turned and plaques and markers and statues for famous events and men. One statue in Boston Commons astonished me, a Negro named Cypress Attucks, who had been the first man to fall in the Boston Massacre. I had never known anything about the Boston Massacre. I roamed everywhere. In one direction, I walked as far as Boston University. Another day, I took my first subway ride. When most of the people got off, I followed. It was Cambridge, and I circled around in the Harvard University campus. Somewhere I had already heard of Harvard, though I didn't know much more about it. Nobody that day could have told me that I would have given an address before the Harvard Law School forum some 20 years later. So he's about 14 now, so maybe when he was 34 or so, he gave that speech at law, the Harvard Law School. I also did a lot of exploring downtown. Why a city would have two big railroad stations, North Station and South Station, I couldn't understand. At both of the stations, I stood around and watched people arrive and leave. And I did the same thing at the bus station everywhere Ella had met me. My wanderings even led me down the piers and the docks where I read plaques telling about the old sailing ships that used to put port, have port there. In a letter to Wilfred, Hilda, Filbert, and Reginald back in Lansing, I told them about all of this and about all the winding, narrow cobblestone streets and the houses jammed up against each other. Downtown Boston, I wrote them, had the biggest stores I've ever seen in white people's restaurants and hotels. I made up my mind that I was going to see every movie that came in to the fine air-conditioned theaters. On Massachusetts Avenue next door, one of them, the Lowe State Theater, was huge, exciting, Roseland State Ballroom. Big posters out front advertised the nationally famous bands, white and Negro, that played there. Coming next week, when I, rent, when I went by that first time, was Glenn Miller. I remember thinking how nearly the whole evening's music at Mason High School dances had been Glenn Miller's records. What wouldn't that crowd have given to be where I was, I wondered, to be standing where Glenn Miller's band was actually going to play? I didn't know how familiar with Rosalind I was going to become. Ella began to grow concerned because even when I had finally had enough of sightseeing, I didn't stick around very much on the hill. She kept dropping hints that I ought to mingle with those nice people your age who were to be seen at the towns and drugstore two blocks from her house and a couple of other places, but... Even before I came to Boston, I had always felt and acted toward anyone my age as if I were in the kid class, like my younger brother Reginald or something. They had always looked up to me as if I were considerably older than them. On weekends back in Langsing, where I'd go to get away from the white people in Mason, I'd hung around in the Negro part of town with Wilfred and Filbert set. Though all of them were several years older than me, I was bigger and I actually looked older than most of them. I didn't want to disappoint or upset Ella, but despite her advice, I began going down to the town ghetto section, that world of grocery stores and walk-up flats and cheap restaurants and pool rooms, bars, storefronts and churches, pawn shops. That seemed to hold a natural lure for me. Not only was this part of Roxbury much more exciting, but I felt more relaxed among Negroes who were being their natural selves and not putting on airs like the hill people. Even though I did live on the hill, my instincts were never and still aren't to feel myself better than any other Negro. I spent the first month in town with my mouth hanging open. The sharp dressed cats who hung around on the corners and in the pool rooms, bars and restaurants and who obviously didn't work anywhere completely entranced me. 
I couldn't get over the marveling at how their hair was straight and shiny like white men's hair. Ella told me that's called a conch. I had never tasted a sip of liquor, never even smoked a cigarette, and here I saw little black children, 10 and 12 years old, shooting craps and playing cards and fighting and getting in grown getting grown ups to put a penny or a nickel on their number for them, things like that. And these children grew around swear words I'd never heard of before, even in slang, even and slang expressions that were just as new to me as stud and cat and chick and cool and hip. Every night as I lay in bed, I turned these new words over and over in my mind. It was shocking to me that in town, especially after dark, you'd occasionally see a white girl and a Negro man strolling arm in arm along the sidewalk and mixed couples drinking in the neon lit bars, not slipping off to drink in some corner as in Lansing. I wrote Realford and Philbert about that too. I wanted to find a job myself to surprise Ella. One afternoon, something told me to go inside of a pool room whose windows I had been looking through for a while. I had looked through that window many times. I wasn't yearning to play pool. In fact, I'd never held, held a cue stick, but I was drawn by the straight and cool looking cats standing around and inside, bending over the big green felt top tables, making bets and shooting bright colored balls into holes. As I stared through the window this particular afternoon, something made me decide to venture inside and talk to the dark stubby conch headed fellow who racked up the balls for the pool players whom I had heard people call Shorty. One day he had come in outside and seen me standing there and he said, hey, Red. So that made me figure he was friendly. As inconspicuously as I could, I slipped inside the door and around the side of the pool room, avoiding people and onto the back where Shorty was filling an aluminum can with powder that pool players dust their hands with. He looked up at me. Later on, Shorty would enjoy tease me about how, that first glance, he knew my whole story. <laughs> Man, that cat still smell country, he used to say, laughing. Cat's legs were so long that his pants was so short his knees showed, and his head looked like a briar patch, he used to say. But that afternoon, Shorty didn't let any of this show on his face, none of this country. I appeared when I told him I'd appreciate it if he'd tell me how somebody could go about getting a job like his. If you mean racking up balls, Shorty said, I don't know of no pool joints around here needing anybody. You mean you just want a, any slave work you can find? A slave meant work, a job. He asked what kind of work I had done. I told him that I washed restaurant dishes in Mason, Michigan. He nearly dropped the powder can. My homeboy, man, give me some skin. I'm from Lansing, too. I never told Shorty, and he never suspected that he was about 10 years older than I. He could look to be, he took us to be about the same age. At first, I would have been embarrassed to tell him. Later, I just never bothered to tell him. Shorty had dropped out of his first year in high school in Lansing, lived a while with his uncle and aunt in Detroit, and had spent the last six years living with his cousin in Roxbury. But when I mentioned the names of Lansing people and places, he remembered many of them. And pretty soon we sounded as if we had been raised on the same block. I could sense Shorty's genuine gladness. And I don't have to say how lucky I felt to find my first friend as hip as he obviously was. Man, this is a swinging town if you can dig it, Shorty said. You're my homeboy and I'm gonna school you on the happenings. I stood there and grinned like a fool. You gotta go anywhere now? Well, stick around until I get off. One thing I liked immediately about Shorty was his frankness. When I told him where I lived, he said that I was all, he said what I already knew, that nobody in town could stand the hill Negroes. But he thought a sister who gave me a pad and not charging me rent and not even running me out to find some slave meaning some job couldn't be all that bad shorty slave in the pool room he said was just to keep ends together while he learned his horn a couple of years before he'd hit the numbers and bought a saxophone got it right there in his closet now from my lesson tonight got it right there in the closet now from my lesson tonight shorty was taking lessons with some other studs 
and he intended one day to organize his own small band. There's a lot of bread to be made gigging right now in Roxbury, Shorty explained. I don't gig joining some big bands one night and all over the place to say that I played with Count or Duke or somebody. I thought that was smart. I wished I had studied the horn, but never had been exposed to one. All righty. I do believe that that's about 25 minutes. Thank you for joining me. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And that was um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, part number five. Or yeah, was that part number five? I don't know. It was five or four, but when I post it, I'll know. Take care. Have a good Saturday.